Welcome to the Scaling Startups Podcast. I'm your host, Irene Ortiz-Glass. Founders are visionaries who are pushing boundaries and bringing the non-existent to life. It's challenging and also very exciting at the same time. But at some point, this vision requires people, process, and structure. The Scaling Startups Podcast seeks to explore the truth behind what it takes to scale startups, leaders, and organizations. It's about managing energy and focus while not killing the dream. It is my pleasure to be here with the two Davids. I'm going to call them the two Davids today. Um, Both from Veterinary Emergency Group, uh, we have Dr. David Bessler, who is founder and CEO, and we have David Gladstein, co-founder and president. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. So happy to have you. Thanks, Irene. Good seeing you. Good to see you. So I am going to just share a little bit about the two of you as we get ready to jump into the conversation. So Dr. David Bessler is a career emergency veterinarian since 2003. Dr. Bessler has a passion for helping people and their pets when they need it most. His intense focus on families made him realize emergency care was broken and wasn't working for anyone. Dr. Bessler took a holistic view of the ER experience from start to finish and from every angle to make it better. Pets would be treated like people and pet parents like human beings. That gets me every time. In 2014, armed with a vision and a dedication um, of, with a team of like-minded people, the first veggies, as they are called, he purchased his first veg hospital. They worked to reinvent the emergency room experience. It was in this first hospital that veg became not normal, but in a good way. This new experience was fully transparent with an open floor plan. They created a comfortable setting for pets, even if that meant getting on the floor with them and keeping people and their pets together throughout treatment. Dr. Bessler also defined a positive company culture to make sure Veg would deliver on this revolutionary shift. It was exactly what pet parents and emergency vet professionals wanted, as Veg has the highest NPS score in vet industry, which is wonderful. Um, And let me just share with you David Gladstein's background. Uh, David is educated at Emory University with an MBA from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. David Gladstein became immersed in the investment world uh, upon graduation, and his significant experience was built on investing in helping small businesses to grow, and it led him to join forces with David Bessler in building the world's veterinary emergency company. From his research and experience, David recognized the veterinary industry lacked innovation and entrepreneurship. He believed a successful and reimagined veterinary business model required being fully invested in its customers and staff. This meant a full revamp of the customer experience, as well as the need to foster a robust team culture. Within, with a better way in sight and a partner in Dr. Bessler who shares the same vision for vet medicine, David is building a world-class veterinary emergency company, bringing a revolutionary customer experience to as many people and their pets as possible. So what a story. Um, both of you have such different backgrounds, yet what I love about you is there's a symbiotic relationship between the two of you. So let's talk a little bit about how did you all come together? I mean, you've got the finance guy, you've got the visionary who has this dream of pet parents loving the experience. Tell us a little bit about how you met and your journey as you built Veg. I think the way the way that we met really starts with David. So I'll have him I'll have him tell the story from his perspective. Um, I guess that one fateful night or day. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that. We, we always kind of believe that these things happen for a reason. And, um, you know, I was looking to do something entrepreneurial. I guess I'll talk for David in a sense and say, I think David was looking for to grow his business. And, um, you know, I, I wanted a chance to help build something. I thought the veterinary space was in really need of something new, something different. The humanization of pets is very much a real thing. And I think David identified the need for better care for given customers desire for a better experience. And so that combo kind of allowed us to both be ready to meet. And I think then I was looking for some, something in someone to partner with. And I typed in veterinarian near me in Google. Um, It was in the evening. So David smartly was paying for good Google AdWords in the evening because the business at the time was open overnight weekend and holidays. And uh, David came up first. 
and uh, it said veterinary emergency group. And I knew I wanted to do something in veterinary space because, as you said, and um, you gave a really good bio of me, Irene. So, as you said in the bio, is I knew there was something to do there. I wrote to David and I said, "Hey, you know a lot about the vet space. You have these two great hospitals in White Plains and Rockland. I read the Google reviews and see how your customers love it. Um, if you're ever interested in growth, I'd love to chat." And uh, knowing David um, and how curious he is, um, and how eager he was to build uh, something bigger than just himself. Uh, he wrote me back and he said, yeah, let's meet. Um, you want to take it from there? And then yeah, at that time, so I had my my wife, Marnie, and I had um, bought this one emergency practice. And this is after I had been working as an emergency doctor um, uh, for about 10 years uh, for a company that started off very small. I was with them when they had one hospital and then was uh, with them through their growth till they had like 47 hospitals. And... Uh, I decided to strike out on my own and just buy one and just kind of create a work environment that I wanted to work in that uh, and that I imagined other people would want to. And so I uh, did that. My wife and I bought that one small emergency hospital and just started doing things differently. It came from a I mean, I had a knowledge of veterinary emergency medicine and uh, I knew what pet owners wanted. I knew what veterinary emergency professionals wanted and I knew the medicine. And I really didn't know much about running a small business that I had to learn myself on the way. I, I just, uh, I remember when I bought the practice, they just, they they gave me all the, you know, the due diligence um, and I got a PL and that's how I learned. I just kind of copied it into um, Google Sheets and that's how I learned to read a PL. But uh, yeah, we just started doing things differently uh, at that one hospital and things went well. The, the business, had, which had not been doing well before I bought it, really turned around. And then my wife and I built another one really right across the river in a, the next county. And that one took off. And it's funny how what, what we thought took off, like we thought that was like amazing then. Uh, it's like now it's like, you know, tiny. Like, honestly, that one hospital that we thought like took off is now eight times as big. Um, wow. wow. But uh, yeah, so we had those two hospitals and that's when I got, uh, I got that email from David and I realized like, well, if we can do it well in two places, we can probably do it well beyond that. And and then, so I went to go see David at his practice in White Plains. And um, I think it takes a special something to look at something and see what it can become versus what it is. And I think what David had already become was a place where customers wanted to go for emergencies. And I think what we could see was that um, we could be doing this more than just in White Plains. And in White Plains, I think we were just getting started. And so we started working together and found that we had um, you know, we kind of say the same from the start, which is we have the exact same values. We care about the same things, um, but we have very complementary skills. And I think if you're ever looking for a partner, looking for that skill set that ma that is complementary, but having shared values is really important, whether it's a professional or personal relationship. That's such and, a good point. Uh, That's such a good point. I ask people all the time that are co-founders, like, how does the what's the magic here? It can be really hard. It can be yeah. really hard. Um, you know, I'm sure it has been for you from time to time. That's just natural in a relationship of two people leading a business. What has helped you to balance each other? What has been the secret sauce there to help you sort of navigate, you know, who, where someone starts and someone stops? I think a funny, very often I compare um, having employees to like having children, like being a parent. Um, I think, uh, running a company with a partner is very much like running a marriage with a, with a spouse. And um, I know we both have great marriages and I will tell you that um, in each of our marriage, we're committed to the marriage, to making it work. We, the marriage, you know, kind of contains a family and you're committed to the family and to the, and to those values. And so if there's any sort of friction, because we're, we're both committed to, um, to this business being successful and the values behind the business, um, those things are the most important things. Whatever kind of comes up between us, um, that uh, always takes second seat to the values and the mission of the mm -hmm. company. And so That's we just we, we, realize we just figure it out. If there's any sort of conflict, we know like we're going to have to either compromise or one of us is just going to have to give in. I think and, we cheer you know, for each other, right? So I think we have to take joy in what each other goes through. And I think if you can do that, um, I think that allows you to want the other partner to do really well. And I think we also aligned ourselves from the start, which is, you know, the reality is like we started a business, the business's goal is to provide a great service to its customers and its uh, employees, but also to make money. And I think when um, David and I 
you know, created a structure where we both would succeed if Edge succeeded. And I think that is um, maybe not always perfectly equal, but really close. And I think that allows us to, um, you know, I think that allows us to really be on the same page in that sense. You know, from a business perspective, we learned we needed to align our customers, our veggies, and our friend veterinarians. And I think we also learned, hey, if that's if that's what they, if that's our business plan is to align our our most important stakeholders, then we need to align ourselves too. So we also aligned ourselves in that sense. So we got really good advice in the beginning, which is good fences make good neighbors. And mm. I think that we have um, uh, hat chair, hat hat tip to Keith Johnson for that one from Sequoia, but uh, I think that David and I found that we did split up our roles actually in the beginning. We don't do the same things. And I think that has been really helpful for us too. And, and if it's not, you know, inappropriate to ask, like how do you do that, right? Because I'm, I'm just gonna say many of our listeners are sitting on the other end of listening to this, trying to figure out how to do that. And I do believe having worked with you um, over the last year that there is a very strong degree of alignment between your gifts, values, and strengths and how you've split the roles. I mean, I'm, it's very clear to me that you're in your lane of energy when you are doing your, what you do. I think, uh, it's the complementary skill set. I think that, uh, David and I both care about everything. Um, we care about every aspect of the business. Um, but when it comes to, we just naturally divide up the things that we want to spend our time doing and think that we're like the best. If there's something, for example, building out a headquarters is, um, you know, a, a, a corporate team is something that not only um, do I, I've never seen it done. So I don't even know what good looks like, let alone have I ever like, you know, done it myself. Whereas David had done both. And um, because of that, when it came time, like when it comes time to, uh, source people. Um, David's just like amazing at sourcing people for our headquarters team, um, figuring out the org structure. That's just, that's where David's expertise is. I care and I weigh in. Um, but, you know, David's the one who just kind of, you know, who runs that when it comes to things about veterinary medicine and, you know, what uh, a customer experience, um, what veterinary professionals want, that kind of thing. That's, that's the world that I lived in. And um, David cares a whole lot about that. Um, but that's what I naturally naturally fall into. So we really didn't actively divide up the, the workload. We really, um, I think we both sort of naturally fell into what we do best, but both of us cared a ton about, about everything. And I think we also both work really hard. I know we work in different things. Like we definitely, more so over the years, quite honestly, in different things. But, um, but I think a good partner knows that the other partner has your back and is willing to work hard too. And I think the reason, I think that, I get, I'll speak for myself, I think that allowed me, knowing that David is working in materially different things than I am often, um, and certainly I would say more things that are um, uh, less tangible, right? Like um, related to culture and related to experience that aren't, you know, you can't just yeah. produce something and show off. Um, but I know David's always thinking through that and always thinking about it and trying to be better. And I think that, um, I think, you know, there are always, I think founder relationships fall apart, um, when the other person, when there's unequal effort and unequal appreciation, mm -hmm. and I think we have equal effort and equal appreciation. And by the way, that doesn't always have to be at the same time, right? Sometimes I might be going hard on David. Sometimes David's going harder than me. There's no, like, uh, yeah. I just mean, over time it's, it's all, it's, it's all fair. And I think there's That's a fair great. Well, and let's talk about the success you've had. Can we just do that for a second? Because it's pretty phenomenal. Um, what's What's been going on with growth? Let's talk about that. Because we're here to talk about scaling. So it's like, how did, in the heck did you make this happen? Um, I, oddly, if I, I, I go back to um, uh, the first weeks of COVID, uh, we had, um, we started, when COVID first started, uh, there was a dip in in visits, I would say, uh, and we had about ten hospitals open for reference. And today we have ninety, essentially. So. Yeah, and everybody was just kind of thinking like, well, the world is ending, um, and veterinary medicine, like, it's just how are we going to survive this like drop in our in our caseload, etc. And then uh, all of a sudden, one you know, one week there was like a, it was like a, a business was up a little bit over the week before, and we're like, huh, you know, a little that's interesting. And then the next week it was up even more. And then, you know, everybody got puppies. 
and uh, COVID just ended up um, really helping the, the veterinary world in terms of uh, business um, caseload, we'll say. And but I remember that we made, we started making this mountain chart um, where you know just of like the number of cases, and um, you know you know dipped at first was a little bit of a thing, and then it, like it went up. And what's funny is that uh, if you if when I look at that you know, now when you fill your screen with it, it like, you know, it's like, wow, this like thing. And then, and then as you scroll to the right, it just keeps getting like higher and higher and like, doesn't, and we weren't aware of this scale. So it's like at the foot of the mountain, um, you know, back in 2020, uh, and we didn't realize we were like, you know, kind of standing on the, uh, on the, in the foothills of like Mount Everest. It's like amazing at like how much, you know, how much greater it went from then. So just our business has grown from, you know, just a, a few hundred employees to the 5,000 employees that it has today. And we're seeing like a, I guess a run rate of like a million cases a year. I think the biggest thing though is we learned that if we build it, they will come and very early on that like ER professionals, nurses, doctors, assistants, we're looking for something different. And I think from the outside, I'm able to see that maybe a little easier than David because he's in it um, as a professional in the ER space. And I, I think that we've added, you know, 4,800 or 4,980 employees from the time that David and I have met. Um, and I think we've also changed, you know, tens of thousands of careers because I bring that up because, you know, we're the largest employer now on veterinary campuses and we've created opportunities and growth for nursing that were definitely ne not there before. And I think our push also pushed the industry in a better way, meaning the things that we were doing didn't just help veg. I think they helped the entire profession. Yeah. And I think that's by taking a blank sheet of paper and saying, Okay, how do we actually do this better? David started the customer experience journey by just reimagining it. I think, I think we are, we always say like, there's a lot of businesses like Veg, right? That are really good looking, that have really good marketing, that have really good A plus locations. And I think the difference between them and us is often that they have nailed or done a really good job at least on figuring out most of the customer experience, right? I think where they have not done as well as Veg, um, and this is not to pat ourselves on the back, but this is deliberate, is I don't think they've nailed the employee experience. And mm -hmm. I think the employee experience is what uh, is the most scalable thing we have. Um, and I think the employee experience is the biggest differentiator for us. And I think it's mm -hmm. the thing that we actually think about much more than the customer experience even. Because if we nail the employee experience, the employees will then nail the customer experience. Um, and um, you know, I think that's been the secret sauce is that David and I love people. Like people is, we're a people business that happens to be in the emergency vet world. Yeah. And um, I think because of that, we've been able to both be in the same page. Um, like I'm not pushing David on P&L and he's not pushing me on culture. We both believe in it. That's um, great. Amazing. And I think that alignment and that value that you have around the employee experience transcends all of these locations. So. The question now is at what point, right? You know, you have these two hospitals and you have four and you have 10, now you have 90. At what point do you realize we need to like infuse a little structure here, or maybe different expertise or, you know, functional experience at headquarters? Like when did you notice, like at what point did you feel that or notice that? And how did you tackle it? Let me go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sure. so I think, uh, first dinner David and I had was with Marnie, his wife, and me, and his uh, lovely accountant. And we, um, I asked David and his wife what they wanted to do when they grow up. Meaning, what do you want the business to be? Do you want it to be an empire? Or do you want to have one or two? And then, and um, David wanted to create an empire, and so did I. Um, not an empire in that we're kings or or queens or a fiefdom, but like an empire that like something much bigger than just you know a local area. And so from the start, we knew that, okay, if you want to create, you, we knew what we wanted to be, which was emergencies are rental name, it's all we do, so we do it best. So we knew we wanted to create an emergency business that was big. Okay, so then we want to create an emergency business that's big, we need to create a system that works for customers, employees, and referring partners. So then um, I think when we realized it was that so we knew what we wanted to become, so there was no doubt about that, right? So you need to plan and build a business around that. But the second part is once it became, once our veggies in the field could no longer get enough from just me and David, meaning by calling us, um, I think we realized that we needed to build a real team around that. And then there's always multiple phases a company goes through. I think our first phase was, okay, now we're beyond four hospitals. David and I really only have a purview for 
you know, call it, we can only oversee 100, 200 people well, right? Ourselves and run a business and grow a business and define culture and all that. So we started to bring in great people around us. Um, and then the second big phase was when David talked about with COVID, which was, okay, 2020, 2021 come around, our business is really taking off. We actually need people who have done this before. And David always uses this great term, which is we can uh, vegify a professional better than we can professionalize a veggie often. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes. And so um, we just needed to bring a mix of some people that have done it before, you know, so people that have done operations well before, done finance well before, done um, culture well before, done clinical training, done marketing well, and team that with our OG veggies. Um, just like we team David and my skills, we team the people at our headquarters, uh, which we call veg quarters, and the people in the field, and we need to team them together. So I think we learned that once David and I were beyond being able to sleep in a hospital and affected ourselves and our sleeping bags that we needed a... Uh, uh, we needed to create something great. But I think the first part of that, Irene, is is recognizing what you want to be, right? So if mm. you know what you want to be, then you can build a business around it. If you don't know what you want to be when you grow up, it's really hard to scale because what are you scaling? You don't know what you're scaling. In a very, so in a very big picture kind of way, I think when we when David and I started, we were, we had the humility that we we met people that had a tremendous amount of experience and wisdom. And they gave us a lot of advice and I think unlike a lot of founders who want to do it themselves, do it their way, we listened to those people. And I would say we listened to the vast majority of what they had to tell us. Um, but we picked some things that were very, very important. That's where we decided to not listen to them. And what were those? Would you share one? That sounds fascinating. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think... Uh, look, the people... You're talking about structure, right? And so um, people who know how to... Um, even it's like like let's say manage the finances of a you know of a billion dollar business versus a you know uh, twenty million dollar business, uh, they have expertise in that, and I'm going to listen to them uh, when 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 they talk about that when they talk about you know managing thousands of people versus dozens of people. Uh, but I I look around at the companies that are out there and I'm like, well, they actually don't know anything about culture. They're really just a few companies in the world that I think actually understand what culture is. Um, and I just happen to not be talking to those people. You know what I mean? Like they're, that's, they're, they're not the people who've been advising us. They're few and far between. And so there it was like, we're actually going to read our own books, listen to our own podcasts, try to get as much as we can from those people and then do that our way. Um, I look at emergency medicine, for example, and I see like the, the veterinary world, um, uh, kind of idolizes the human medical world in so many ways and some in some ways that's deserved they certainly like you know see more cases etc than you know than we do um but in some ways the human medicine world has like a ton to learn from the veterinary world and i yeah. would say there's really nobody that understands veterinary emergency medicine it is not like human emergency medicine in so many ways and it is not like the rest of veterinary medicine in some ways mm -hmm. and i felt through my experience like i knew more about that and so i'm going to listen to myself um yeah. and not listen to them I think people always said like you should do urgent care, you should do general practice, you should do specialty care within your hospital. Um, and I think we've always, uh, I think that's something we didn't listen to. That wasn't necessarily people that were so close to us, but just people around us, which is always like easy to add things. And I think that we've really tried to keep it simple and focused. Doesn't mean in the future we wouldn't do things, but like, because never say never to anything. But I think certainly when we were growing up and teenagers, we should not have done that. Um, and we, we didn't. And so how often do you yeah, revisit like, the question, um, yeah. who do we want to be? Do you revisit that conversation? Who do we want to be? I have to say that's kind of stayed the same. Uh, we we okay. basically came up with, we want to be the world's veteran emergency company. The way that we say it is like, uh, if um, I want to pick the right number of years, let's say uh, 30 years ago, aliens landed on the planet and stopped an earthling and said, what is this planet's coffee shop company? Uh, the earthling wouldn't have had an answer. Um, now, whether you like their coffee or not, the answer is Starbucks is this planet's coffee shop company. Uh, I don't, I think if you, if aliens landed and said, what is this planet's veterinary emergency company? I don't think there would be an answer, but veg is becoming that answer. And that's, that's, that was our aim. There's really nobody out there that's just focused on veterinary emergency medicine and doing it great. That's, that's our opening like for world domination. That's what we want to do. And we've been world aligned on domination. That. I love this. Okay. I mean, Going for it, world that is our intergalactic headquarters right here in, in, in White Plains, New York. Yeah, that's awesome. So culture. So let's go there because you make a really good point. Like so far you've mentioned employee experience 
and culture, which obviously go very hand in hand. And you've talked about consistency, customer experience, high MPS scores, all done in a consistent way in many locations. That's really hard to do. Yeah. So talk to the audience about culture and this employee experience and how you've managed to pull that off because consistency is really hard when you're scaling, especially if you have many locations in many different places and you're trying to provide the same amount of consistent customer care and support. Yeah, the way that I start with that is I tell people there's no special definition of culture for business. The definition for culture for business culture, company culture, is the same as culture anywhere. I use the Vikings because I think I'm least likely to offend anybody if I like talk about the Vikings, I don't know. Um, I think uh, if you try to understand like what is Viking culture good or bad, that's like a crazy question. I was like bad, I mean- The Norwegian believe, Vikings, not the Minnesota one. Not the Minnesota. <laughs> I, you believe in um, you know uh, human sacrifice, and I think the rest of the world would be like, oh, bad. They they believe in human sacrifice. I think if you ask the you know the Vikings, they would say it's a great culture. So cultures aren't good or bad. The question is, um, do they align with your values or do they not? And what are the what are the uh, the details of that culture that I, I a good way to understand culture is its values operationalized. There are the values that core values that lie. Um, you know, at the at the center of a culture, and then all of the actions, all of the things that the culture do, that the culture does, that's that that is that is what a culture is. It's like, uh, do they align with the values? Or are they not. And uh, I think most companies, when you look at it, they don't have a set culture. They can't define their core values. There may be aspirational values. You know, they'll say like timeliness is one of our values, and like, oh, so everybody's always on time, and like they're not. So it's an aspirational value. It's not what they actually are. In fact, they probably value chaos. Um, or value individual time because then nobody's on time because they're all you know individuals. So uh, the first thing is to understand what are your core values, and um, Veg's core values. And when when you hear them, you'll see they and you know anything about what are, what makes Veg different, uh, you'll see they make sense. Our core values are openness. We have open hospital concepts. Um, openness, togetherness. Everybody is together in one room doing their emergencies together. Heroic helping, we go really out of our way and sacrifice ourselves to do like the greatest need that needs to be done. And meaningful moments where we create these meaningful moments, we cry about them, we save a pet's life, we applaud, we, you know, all those things. Those are our core values. All of our actions are all based around those core values. And you have to have actions. What are your rituals? What's your language? We all wear our veg swag. That is an operationalized value of togetherness. We all wear the same thing. Hmm. Uh, and uh, you know we have uh, big giant heads meetings. It's like open to the entire company, where um, you know that is uh, openness operationalized. And so the the I think the most important thing about when you're going to create is you actually have to create something. Your culture has to have core values. It has to have rituals. And then uh, I learned it from my you know my Jewish upbringing. There's there we got a Bible. Um, it's you got to be written down. Like where there's no way we're going to be able to communicate with five thousand people growing every day. And so you have to write it down somewhere. And so all we did just just took pen to paper and started writing that stuff down in our manifesto and it's there for everybody to read we make it fun so they enjoy reading it um that's a culture culture has to be rich otherwise it's just a like yeah we're good or we're bad or we're nice or we're not and that's not a real culture wow so embedding that into your hospitals what's the mechanism for that because really probably easy to do at your headquarters where everyone's together and we can vi revisit but how do you infuse it so it lives beyond you right yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I think it's it's actually goes back to that first thing, which is what we look for in leaders. I think the reason we have a consistent approach for what we look for in a leader doesn't mean that the personality it can be just like me and David, totally different interests or different alignments, but their values that they, they need to care about veg values, right? They need to live those veg values. And if they do, those are the type of things people we look for. The way that we scale, like I love your, the, I think the title for your, I think I know the title for your podcast is Scaling Startups. And the best way to scale is culture. Culture is the most scalable asset that we have at Veg. Mm -hmm. And um, the way we look to scale culture is look to find great leaders. And if we can mm -hmm. find great leaders in a hospital, then we can scale culture. And so what David and I look for in leaders is people that share the same core values that we have. And um, when we built the organization, we built it deliberately, both in the field and at VQ, focused on finding leaders who believe in those things. And um, I think that's the biggest reason that when we walk into a hospital in Fort Worth, 
we feel the same experience that we walk into a hospital in the Upper East Side mm -hmm. of Manhattan or in Santa Monica, yeah. California, or in um, Minnesota, right? Yeah. We find those things by having the same leaders who believe in the same things. They train at yeah. the same place that our headquarters team here. They train yeah. under the same people. Those same people were trained by me and David. Me and yeah. David were um, have the same beliefs. And so if you push all that down, that's the leaders are the ones who can just like we need to, you know, find great veggies and give them a great experience. So they give customers a great experience. We need to find great leaders who will then give our our veggies a great experience. Yeah. And I know you both do a really great job. And this is the difference that I see from other clients that we work with and you is that you talk about the values all the time. You revisit them when you have conversations in your meetings. They're on walls. That's great. But you're actually always bringing them up in the interview process, in the conversations with leadership team meetings. Like it's a really ongoing dialogue. And I don't see that that often with other customers, other clients. They seem to just have them on the wall. But to your point, they're not in front of you very often or discussed or revisited. And I think you do a really good job of that. So Thanks. hats off, hats off to you for that. <laughs> so my last question is more personal. Um, along this journey, how have you evolved as leaders, right? So there's the enterprise, there's scaling people, there's structures, there's processes and all these things you've had to create. How have the two of you had to, you know, sort of evolve in your leadership roles over the last few years? Um, every day, I, I, the way I've experienced it is, uh, every day our company is growing and requires me to change the way that I do my job. Uh, one of the most noted there, there are sometimes quantum leaps that are more noticeable, but every day I'm learning new skills to help me, um, be able to do the job at that new, at that new level. But one of those examples is, um, when we really started, we took one year, um, we called it the, the year of um, foundations under our castles in the, in the air. Uh, castles in the air were just like all these great things that we had going on at Veg, but they were not sustainable, especially they, they weren't scalable and we had to put foundations under them to allow them to grow. We hired a lot of professionals uh, at Veg Quarters, people like uh, CFO, uh, COO, Chief People Officer. Um, and once that happened, you know, we, we looked for great people that had great experience, were very wise. We vegified them, we found professionals, we vegified them. That took a lot of time. David and I spent a lot of time here at Veg Quarters making sure, holding them accountable to the Veg ways. They wouldn't paint us with the same brush that they did the last company they came from, realizing Veg was different. But then once we had them kind of installed, uh, you know, David and I sort of like looked at each other and said like, well, they can really tend to the, to the daily running of the company. Well, you know, what is our job now? And we had to learn that say uh, we kind of took our airplane to a new, uh, you know, a new altitude and had to operate from there. Um, David recently shared um, with me um, a video. You can tell a story about, about Mark Zuckerberg and his employees call him the eye of Sauron, where they if there's something that's important to him, there's nothing about that thing he doesn't know uh, and doesn't care about and doesn't stick his, you know, his hands into. And so I'm like on a clinical, like I just, I worked a shift alongside our, uh, our veggies, our, you know, doctors yesterday. Um, I'll dive deep down into that and poke around and sort of sample the product and see what's going on our front lines and then zoom, zoom out and look at the whole organization from a clinical perspective. So we're constantly learning new things like that. It's for me, that's been the most fun and most challenges. I have a new job every day uh, hmm. as we grow. That's been a lot of fun for me. I think that I, um, all that too, right? Um, I think the only things I would add are, I used to believe that um, you should treat people the way you want to be treated, that I want to be treated. And I think I've learned that I need to treat people the way they want to be treated. And um, I, you know, we have different roles, right? But I think that I know exactly why I exist in my role every day, which is um, to coach and mentor our execs and our um, VPs and directors here um, to set our goals, uh, figure out what grade looks like within those goals and hold our leaders accountable to doing them along our, along our core values and the things Dave and I believe in and then keep us on offense, right? So as we get bigger, we need to be a startup still, a startup culture, a startup mentality. So that, that's, I focus on those three things, right? And within that, I think coaching and mentoring is, I think that the beginning of my days of edge, I was the doer, right? I, you know, did pretty much every job at VQ. Um, and um, and I actually think I'm 
you know, the concern is you become a leader at a bigger company is like, that's what I did great. Um, and I think what I've uh, come to appreciate and like now is my job is different than it was before, which is I have to focus more on coaching and mentoring, not just on doing. And I think um, that's why I brought up, I need to treat people the way they want to be treated, which is I think the, the most, one of the most important things a leader can do is figure out the people they work with and how best uh, to bring them together and how to get the best out of them for the greater good of the company and the greater good of our customers and our, our veggies. And um, I know that um, my legacy and David's will be like the people that we can, um, can we make people better, right? Can we make people better at their jobs? Can we make people better veggies? Um, and how do we do that through coaching and mentoring? And I think that's how our roles have evolved the most, which is that is now the most important thing we can do is teaching culture, is teaching the things that are important to veg, teaching people about a P&L if that's what it takes. But ultimately, um, our job is is to give back to veg through coaching and mentoring. And I think that's where we try to spend our time and think about it. And I think that's what we want to be known for. Yeah, I love I love you guys because you have a people first mentality that you believe that if you actually exercise that, pets and families are served. I mean, that's basically what you've said in this podcast. Like if we treat people well and develop them, coach, mentor them, have them rooted in our values, they will perform and they have. And it's really rare that people put a stake in the ground on culture, values and employee engagement as an indicator of future performance and you did that and it's paying huge dividends and you have a lot of very very happy customers running around out there with their most beloved family member like my abby <laughs> you know their pets and we would do anything for her i think she's a person um so thank you both for being here for your commitment to pets and their families for your commitment to your employees because honestly i've met and been around many of them who love working for you and you know we do know that engagement is an emotional connection that we have with the people we work with and the culture of our company and people worry today a lot about engagement and they don't worry about it at veterinary emergency group because they are engaged um, they are committed and love the culture so thank you both for being here it's such a pleasure and um, i'll see you both soon thank you thanks Aaron. thanks Aaron.